feel something. I prayed with so many people that I mean the power of God just hit them. They felt it. I felt it. And I say, you're healed. And they say, hey, man, I believe I'm going to go to the doctor and see. <laughs> and I just think you lost it right there. They have to wait. You know, there's a lot of people that they start saying, I'm healed. But what they're thinking is, I'm going to say that I'm healed. And if I'll say this, then I will be healed. That's not how it works. You have to say that you're healed because you believe that you've really been healed. And yet so many people think, how can I believe that I'm healed if I don't feel it? If I still got this pain, if I still have these symptoms, I tell, you know what the Bible calls that? I'm going to be blunt with you. I always am, it seems like. I, the older I get, the blunter I get. I don't know what it is. I just hadn't got time to pussyfoot around, amen, and tell you stuff. But I'm just telling you, when you sit there and, and say, how can I believe that I'm healed when I still have pain, when I still have my headache, when I still can't move or do something? Bible calls that carnal. Carnal doesn't necessarily mean sinful. All sin is carnal, but not all carnality is sin. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 talks about laying aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. There are things that will weight you down and will stop you from receiving from God that aren't straight out sins. And one of them is you just saying that, well, how can I believe that I'm healed if I still have the problem, if I haven't seen the right results? And that's what the Bible calls carnal. Carnal just means that you are controlled by your five senses. There are people that don't believe anything is real except what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And I'm telling you, that's what the Bible calls carnal. And so if you say, well, I believe that I'm healed. And so I'm going to start confessing that I'm healed. I'm going to get up and start acting like I'm healed. I'm going to do this and this and this. And then I believe that God is going to heal me. That's what the Bible calls carnal. You have to get to a place to where you really believe that you're healed right now. I don't care what anything looks like, what you feel like. And some of you, well, how can you do that? I'd be a hypocrite. I'd be lying to say that I'm healed when the truth is I hurt, when I've got a fever, when I have all of these problems. It just depends what you consider is the real you. And you know, many of you have heard me teach on this, so I'm not going to go into that right now. But my teaching on spirit, soul, and body is what set me on this path and has totally changed my life when I realize that there is more to me than just what I, my physical body and just my soulish realm. There is a third part to me, that's my spirit, and your spirit cannot be seen, it cannot be felt, it is impossible to contact your spirit in any way except through believing what the Word of God says. John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus was the one speaking, and he says, The flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word reveals to us spiritual truth. And it's true whether you feel it or not. And the average person just has a disconnect. They cannot believe that anything is true that they can't perceive in their little peanut-sized brain. If you can't feel it, if it's not in your emotions, then it doesn't exist. And we have a lot of Christians that will go through the motions of saying, yeah, I'm healed, but they are saying it and acting, hoping that they will become healed instead of acting because they believe they already are healed. And it's a heart condition. I know that there's some people that came here today and you're believing that you will be healed when you leave today. And you know what? God loves us so much. He will meet you where your faith is. And so we've got prayer ministers that are going to be here and we're going to be praying for you and we can be the catalyst and we will agree with you. But I'm telling you, that is not God's best. The truth is you've already been healed. The truth is God's already done everything that it takes for you to be well. He doesn't have to touch you. God is not going to heal you today. By his stripes, you were healed. 1 Peter 2, 24, you were healed. It's already done. Jesus has already done his part and it is over, but it's in your spirit and you have to draw it out of your spirit and manifest it into your flesh. So here's what I want to deal with today. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 1 
And I just want to start sharing with you that you need to get this attitude that God has already healed me. He's done his part. I am not waiting on God. You aren't waiting on God to touch you for God to release his power. God has already done his part. That power is now on the inside of you and it's up to you whether you get healed. And some of you, that is very discouraging because you, oh, I thought I was trusted in the Lord and I can't earn it and do all that. You can't. God is, is, moves completely independent of you. But the truth is he's already moved. And here in Ephesians chapter one, verse three, it says, uh, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God has already blessed you. He's already done it. It's not something that has yet to be done. And as long as you see healing as something that is still out in the future and you are just following people around and hoping that maybe this person will be able to get healing for you, that maybe you will do the right thing, then you'll get healed. As long as you have that mindset, you are going to have to get healed off of somebody else's faith. That is not the right type of faith. You need to start understanding that God has already done it and he's placed this raising from the dead power on the inside of you and it's up to you whether you get healed or not. It's absolutely up to you. And I know some of you right now, well, what are you saying? I have been begging and pleading God and I've been standing and fasting and I've been doing this, but you've been doing it with the mindset of trying to get healed instead of believing that you were healed already. I know some of you, it's going right over your head. I can just tell you, you look like a deer in headlights. And I know because I've hit nine deer. But some of you are just dazed like, well, how can I believe that I'm healed when I don't feel you, when I don't look ill? I still got all the symptoms. The doctor tell me I'm sick. I'm saying this in love, but you're carnal. You're controlled by your senses, but, but this is just reality. That's your problem is you think that what you feel and what you see, that this is more real than the spiritual world. But did you know that the spiritual world is what created this physical world? Over in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen, that's everything that you see here, were made uh, out of things that do not appear. It didn't say made out of nothing. They were made out of things. It was things that exist in the spiritual realm. The spiritual world existed before the physical world. The spiritual world is the parent force. The parent is greater than what it created. This physical world is going to pass away, but the spiritual world, you and I are a spirit being and you never die. Your physical body will someday lay down, but your spirit never dies. It always exists. Every person's spirit is still existing. The spirit realm is more real than this physical realm. Amen. That is amazing. Amen. And some of you will sit here and when I say it, you'll acknowledge it, but on your own, you don't think that way. You live in the carnal. You live by how you feel. You live by what the doctor says. And I'm not against doctors. Man, if it wasn't for our doctors, all the Christians would be dead. I'm not against doctors. But I'm saying that doctors are not God. And doctors, the vast majority of them, are not spiritual. And doctors are going to tell you what's happening in the physical, natural realm. And for you to take the word of a doctor above the word of God, you are carnal. Amen. Amen. And I know some of you think, man, you're weird. Well, I think you're weird for taking the word of a doctor when the word of the Lord says, by his stripes you were healed. God says you were healed. If you were, you are. He didn't say you are going to be healed. He says, no, it's in the past tense. I'm not fighting to get healed. I'm coming from a healing. I was healed 2,000 years ago and I am not trying to be healed. I'm already healed. And Satan is trying to steal from me what is rightfully mine and I will not allow it. I am not going to let him take it. It is so much easier to defend and hold on to something that you have than it is to go get something that you don't have. You know, if you say over there is healing and I'm going to be healed, you've already distanced yourself from it. 
you're already saying, I'm not there yet, but I'm going to be there someday. But you know what? Ashley could come up here and tackle me or something and I might not get over there. I could trip down the stairs. Something could happen. If I'm not there, there is a possibility that I might not get there. But once I'm over here, I can't doubt that I'll get where I am. I'm already here. How can I doubt that I'll get here? I'm here. Now, somebody could try and drag me away from where I am, but I guarantee you it's a lot harder to drag me away than it is for me to go someplace that I'm not already. And the average person does not believe that they have been healed. And so they feel something in their body. The doctor tells them they're sick and then they start trying to use faith to confess and believe, I'm going to be healed. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to overcome this. It's a lot easier just to stand and say, I reject this. I was healed. I am healed. And you go by what you believe. Again, the Bible says, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is spiritual truth. And his word says it by his stripes, you were healed. It's already done. So instead of trying to get healed, you have to believe that, Father, I'm already healed. And you know what? I see a lot of people healed. I see a lot of miracles happen. But the, no, probably the majority of people who receive instant manifestations and see a healing come, it's because of this mindset that I'm talking about right here. Now, there are other ways to be healed. But the number one way that I see people get healed is when they quit trying to do something and get God to respond to them hoping that, you know, they can say things right, pray enough, live holy enough or whatever. And instead, they just start believing that I am here. And then they get angry and they start fighting and resisting those symptoms. Amen. You know, many of you, I'm sure, have seen Mike uh, and Caroline Hesh's testimony. He's the guy that had this tumor on his chest right here. And I mean, the thing was as big as both of my fists and it had tentacles that went all through his chest. He fought it for eight years, cancer. And uh, he got to listening to my teaching on this exact subject right here, that by his stripes, you were healed. And he, he started saying, I am healed. It's done. And his wife, I had uh, lunch with her yesterday. Is the reason this is fresh on my mind, but I had lunch with her at communication services people yesterday. And she was talking about that again. And she gave me a piece of testimony that I hadn't seen in the video. And uh, anyway, Mike had started believing that I'm not trying to get healed anymore. I am healed. And he was standing on that. And a guy from his church came over and he says, God sent me over and said, there's just one thing that you're lacking. You got to do this one thing. And uh, Caroline says, I can't tell you what it said, what he said, but it wasn't nice. It says, he started cursing and he says, there isn't a blackity black thing I need. Jesus has already done it. I'm healed. And he got mad and started cursing. And at that moment when the healing started to manifest itself. Now I'm not advocating you cursing. This is not a new recipe. But I am saying that when he just put his foot down and he says, that's it. I am healed and I don't care what it looks like. And Caroline, I was asking her, and it was probably two or three weeks after that. And she had to change the bandages because this thing was oozing all kinds of stuff. And it was a terrible deal. I mean, if you haven't seen that, go to our website and look at this testimony. It's one of the most amazing testimonies you'll ever see. And they took pictures of it. And they got pictures of this terrible looking thing on his chest. And it was, she had to change the bandages. And she says it was two or three weeks later that all of a sudden they realized, hey, it's shrinking. And in six months' time, that thing was totally gone, and they answer our phones now, and they're working here and just doing great. Matter of fact, Mike's ministered here in the school many times. And man, he ministers and see hundreds and hundreds of people healed. But the breakthrough was when he quit trying to get healed, and he says, I am healed. And it didn't look like it for at least two or three weeks before there was any physical symptoms. And it was six months before the full manifestation, but he knew in his heart he had it. And I'm telling you, this is where most people miss it. And when people cross this threshold, and I don't know how to get you there, I'm, I'm saying everything I know today to try and get you to this point. But it just seems like the vast majority of people, they just won't get this because they're carnal. 
They're going to go by what they feel. They're going to go by what the doctor says. They're going to go by all of these other things. And it doesn't matter what the Word says. They aren't going to let the Word of God get in the way of what they believe. This is what I feel. This is what the doctor says. I can see this. What's wrong with you? Are you in denial? I'm not denying that the physical world exists, but I am denying that that's all there is. There is another part of me. There is another world out here. And I am already blessed with all spiritual blessings, not some, all of them. And one of those blessings is healing. You've already been healed. You know, I wish I had time to read every one of these verses, but let me just skip on down. He keeps saying the same thing over and over and over. He says, you are already, you are highly favored. You are ex accepted in the beloved. Did you know this is back in verse 6, Ephesians 1, 6. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The word that was translated accepted here was only used one other time in the New Testament. And that's when the angel appeared unto Mary and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. The only other way this word was used is when it says that Mary was highly favored. You are highly favored. You are blessed. You are accepted. And notice, if you were to read the terminology, I haven't got time to go through every verse, but if you were to read this, it's not saying you can be highly favored. If you will go to church, if you will pay your tithes, if you will do this, if you will speak in tongues, if you will come to Karis, if you'll do this, God will bless you. No, everything is all in the past tense. He's already blessed us. You're already accepted. You already have everything. Most Christians believe God can do anything, that he has done virtually nothing, but he could do it if you would just believe properly. I'm telling you, when you start walking into victory, you move to another realm when you start saying, Father, thank you that it's done. I've got it. I've already got it. I'm not trying to get it. I've already got it. I've got a tape series out entitled, You've Already Got It. And people will call in and say, I want that tape series that Andrew talked about on TV. And they'll say, you've already got it. And they say, I do. <laughs> and we'll say, no, but we'll send it to you. And they say, well, I thought I, you said I already had it. <laughs> we have a lot of fun out of that. But you know what? You've already got it. God's already put inside of you everything that you need. You do not need God to heal you. You need to believe that you're healed before you feel it, before you see it. And if you can ever get to that place to where you believe that you are healed independent of any carnal verification, then the healing will manifest itself. But most people are taking all of the things that we're saying. And man, Daniel and the team here, they just pour their heart out every week. We teach on healing. There are people that come over and over and they take all of these things, but they do these things hoping that that will cause healing to come to pass instead of believing that you're already healed. You need to get to a place that honestly, what God's word says is sufficient. And if you never saw the physical manifestation, that, that's not what we want. It's not glorifying God for us to do that. But I'm saying you ought to get to a place to where you are so established in the fact that I'm healed, that whether it ever manifests itself or not is a secondary issue. I don't know how to explain that exactly, but you can reach a place to where, you know, God, you know, I've given this example before, but there was a woman that had a huge goiter on her neck and she went to a, a camp meeting type of things and they prayed for her. And this woman got up that night and she told everybody, I was healed. And she had this huge goiter on her neck. But you know, people understand that sometimes it takes a brief period of time. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and cursed it. And it was 24 hours later before it dried up from the roots, Mark chapter 11. And so people understand sometimes it takes a brief period of time. So when she got up and testified that I'm healed, even though they could see this huge goiter on her neck, everybody praised God and said, that's great. Next year, she came back to the same conference and she got up and says, it's been one year ago tonight that I got healed of a gorder that was on my neck. But you could still see the thing. And people, you know, were put off by that and thinking, man, this woman's testifying that she's healed. But anybody can tell she's not healed. And, but they didn't say anything. Then the next year she came back. She said, this is the second year anniversary of me being healed. And she, you could still see the gorder. 
And by this time, people were beginning to get upset and say, this is not right. This woman's saying that she's healed when anybody can tell she's not healed. Finally, she came back the next year and she says, this is the third anniversary of my goiter being healed. And she, you could see, she's still at it. People could see it. And finally, they just had all they could take. And so they talked to the leadership and they said, you got to stop this woman from testifying that she's healed when anybody can tell she's not healed. So the leaders went and talked to her. And anyway, that night she prayed and she says, Lord, I know you healed me and I believe it. But these people, they don't believe that you've done anything until they could see it. Would you please take that thing away so that they could believe that I was healed? And the next morning she got up and the order was totally gone. And she got them. She says, I told you I was healed. <laughs> Amen. That's the way you got to get that I'm healed. And I don't care what it looks like. And I can guarantee you, you'll even have well-meaning people come by and say something if they can see or see a physical manifestation of you not manifesting healing. And the whole world system is just built to get you back to going and being controlled and dominated by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. There's people that because they don't have any money back in their bank, they'll say, I'm poor because their relationship is broken up. You know that I'm just a failure and things haven't worked. And that is not the truth. There is a spiritual you. There are spiritual realities that you can't see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. Now, I do believe that when we get into faith and start walking in that, that there will be evidence of it. I'm not saying that you get to where you don't want to see a manifestation of it, but I'm saying that if you wait until the manifestation before you start believing, you're going to never see the manifestation. You got to believe that you receive when you pray. You still got your finger here in Ephesians 1? Well, I'm eventually going to get back there maybe. But look at this in Mark chapter 11. This is after Jesus cursed the fig tree. And he told us we had to believe that we receive when we pray. Mark chapter 11 verse uh, 24 says, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Notice the order here. You have to believe that you receive when you pray. And then you shall, future tense. It might only be a minute, five minutes, a day, a week. I don't know, but there is a future manifestation. You believe you receive right now and then you shall have it. And you've got to believe that you receive before you see it. And yet there's a lot of people, even people that call themselves faith people or whatever, that are actually going through the motions and confessing, but they are doing those things hoping that they will be healed. And they don't really believe that anything has happened until they see it, until they feel it, until a doctor verifies it. But again, I'm not against doctors, but doctors are carnal. All they're going to do is just look in the carnal room. They can't tell you whether you've got the same power inside of you that raised Christ from the dead. And if you wait for a doctor to verify that God's word is true, you're going to miss it. Thank you for that thunder silence. I know that I'm getting personal now. Some of you, most people try healing. And if it doesn't work, then you go to the doctor and try that. And again, I'm not against that, but I'm saying, man, why don't you leave the doctors for the sick people? Why don't you believe, leave them for the people that don't know God? Amen. I'm not against doctors, but man, if you believe that you're healed, you don't have to go that route. You don't have to do all of those things. You can believe that you're healed. You know, there are some people here that'll remember just, I think it's only been two years ago or something that my ear manifested a healing. But I know Daniel and some of the people here uh, saw me for six years. I had a melanoma on my ear. I never went to a doctor and got it confirmed, but I've got a doctor on my board who went out of his way to tell me every year that you're, you got a melanoma. You're going to die if you don't do something and stuff. And I had this thing and it, it would ooze blood and stuff like this. And I just believed I was healed. And honestly, I don't know why it took six years. A lot of it's because I wasn't that concerned over it. It wasn't that big of a deal. I didn't have to look at it. It was all of you that had to look at it. When I look in the mirror, I don't look at the tip of my ear. 
I don't know. Maybe you do, but I don't. I very seldom saw it. I just forgot about it. I knew I was healed. And anyway, a couple of years ago, it finally dried up and everything's good. And everybody, oh, you're healed. And I said, I told you for six years I was healed. (laughs) And I believed I was healed the whole time. It didn't look like I was healed. Amen. Amen. And maybe I didn't do it the best. Maybe I should have given more time to it. I don't know, but I'm just saying that, you know what? I believed I was healed. And it took a while for me to see the healing. But I, when I finally saw it, it wasn't like, wow, it worked. Yeah. It was like I believed it worked six years before. I was just wondering about why it takes so long to manifest. But I knew that I was healed. And that's the way I am. I've got things I'm believing for right now. And you know what? It's better than it was, but it doesn't bother me. I'm healed. I know that I'm healed. I'm not trying to get healed. So back in Ephesians chapter one, he prays a prayer for him. And he says in verse 15, he says, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, and that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Notice how he's praying. This is really significant. I've thought about this a lot, that if the Lord was to tell me that you're going to write a prayer that people 2,000 years in the future would be reading. How would you pray? And I can tell you based on the fact that I've heard lots of people pray and I've been to churches and I've, I've been in meetings where they're praying for people. The vast majority of Christians today would be praying something like, Oh God, pour out your spirit. Oh God, send revival. Oh God, do a new thing. Oh God, touch them. And most of our prayers are trying to get God to do something. Look at Paul's prayer. His prayer is, God, open up their eyes to what they have. It's not God, you do something. It's looking and saying, Father, help them to understand what they already have. That is where the vast majority of Christians are missing it. They believe God can heal, but they don't believe that he has healed. And so they go through all of these things, trying to get healing to come instead of believing that, Father, you've already done it. I'm healed. And I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what the doctors say. I don't care what anybody has to say. I was healed. That's my testimony, and I'm sticking with it. And once you get to where you believe that, and I mean believe it from your heart, then your body will follow. The spirit is much more important. Most of us are wanting our body to manifest the power of God and then our spirit, our emotions will latch on to it and say, yes, amen, but it's just the opposite. And so he's praying that God would just open up, give unto them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and look at verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Man, look at this. The eyes of their understanding. You know, if you study this word out, the word understanding here is the Greek word dianoia, and it's the exact same word that was translated imagination in Luke chapter 1, I believe it's verse 51 and other places. This is talking about God help them to see with their heart that they're healed. Open up the eyes of their understanding. Let them see with their heart that they're healed before they see with their eyes. Man, that is huge. You know, I've given this testimony so many times. I think I gave this last time I taught in healing school, but it just fits. I've heard it a hundred times and I still like it. So I'm going to do it again. But there was this woman who had poor eyesight and the doctor, I mean the uh, uh, optometrist, you know, gave her these uh, glasses that were like the bottom of a Coke bottle. She was legally blind. And there was a healing evangelist coming to her church. So she wanted to avoid him because she'd been prayed for so many times and been disappointed that she didn't want to go through that again. So she avoided him. But the last night of the meeting, he cornered her and he finally said, I want to pray with you. So 
He made her take her glasses off. He prayed for her and he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he said, shut your eyes. And this woman just shut her eyes like, how can I tell if I don't open my eyes? And he said again, he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he said, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes real quickly. And the third time he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he says, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. You got to see yourself seen before you see. And finally she understood what he said. So she kept her eyes closed and she prayed in tongues. And finally she says, I can see it. I see myself seeing. And he says, now open your eyes. And she opened her eyes and she was completely healed and her eyes were healed. But far too often we have people come forward and they're going to get prayer and then immediately they open their eyes to see if they're healed. Immediately they check their body to see if they have a pain. Immediately they run to the doctor to get a new test to see if they're healed. And they are looking for the healing to come from the outside, but it comes from the inside. You got to believe that you're healed. You got to see yourself healed before you see yourself healed. You got to walk by faith and not by sight. And then the next verse, it says in verse 19, and what he's praying that your eyes would be open to what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, accord, to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and on and on it goes. He's praying that your eyes would be open to the power that is already in you. Again, most people believe that, oh God, you've got the power. The doctor says he can heal me. The, the doctor can't do anything, but God, you can do anything. And we just put it all off on him. But he has placed this power on the inside of you. It's not out there. It's inside of you. And you've got to see this. Your eyes have to be opened to recognize I've got raising from the dead power on the inside of me. I've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Did you know if, if you could somehow or another gauge the displays of God's power, creation is awesome. But I guarantee you, raising Jesus from the dead is greater than creating the heavens, the universe, the earth, you and me. The greatest display of God's power ever was raising Jesus from the dead. Because when God created the heavens and the earth, there was no opposition. Satan wasn't fighting against him. There was no resistance. But at the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, every demon in hell was standing there to prevent that, trying to stop it. Satan had Jesus in his grip. He actually went to hell. And Satan was doing everything he could to hold Jesus back. And he couldn't do it. The greatest display of God's power is when he raised Christ from the dead. And this says, open their eyes to the exceeding greatness of the power that is in them. Not out there available to them, but in them. The exceeding greatness of the power that's already in us, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You have raising from the dead power on the inside of you. And yet the average person approaches God like to ask for this healing. It's a big deal. We're really tapping God out. This God, I know this is hard. If you approach your healing that way, the doctor says it's stage four cancer. God doesn't give a rip if it's stage one cancer, five, six. It doesn't make any difference to God. I have people come and say, I know that God heals. I've heard people testify, but does God heal AIDS? Like that's, that's bigger. That's incurable. Nothing is hard for God. Did you know it doesn't take any more power from God to heal cancer than it does a cold? Did you know the doctors can do more for cancer than they can do for your cold? Many of you hadn't thought about that, but you can't heal a cold. You can dry up your nasal passages, but actually if you take medication, I've read medical things on this, that if you take medication, the cold virus will stay in your body longer. 
it actually slows your body down. You can deal with the symptoms and you might get some relief from the symptoms, but the cold virus will stay in your body longer if you take medication than if you just sat there and fought it in the natural. You might be able to deal with the symptoms, but they can't do a thing to heal a cold. You can't heal a cold, but they can cut out cancer. They can irradiate cancer. There's things that they can do. Cancer is actually more treatable than a cold. But you know why people feel differently about it? Because a cold won't kill you. And so they aren't as afraid. And that's the thing that makes cancer worse is the fact that people attach fear to it. People attach unbelief to it. This is incurable. This could kill me. And it's your fear and your unbelief that is the problem. It doesn't take one more ounce of the power of God to heal cancer than it does a cold. But the problem is you think differently about cancer than you think about a cold. And it's that thinking. It's your level of unbelief, your level of carnality that elevates this to being hard. If you understood that you have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and that's more than enough to heal cancer, to heal your hangnail, your headache, your sugar diabetes, whatever it is that you're dealing with. If you ever understood that, I guarantee you, it would be just a short period of time until your body was reflecting the healing power of God. But we just don't know what we've got. We don't realize what we've got. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I got a word for you today, and that is that you're already healed. It's already done. You don't need to get God to heal you. God is looking for you to stand up and believe something that you can't see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. He's looking for people that will just stand up and say, I'm healed. And I refuse to be sick. If you could accept what I'm talking about today. Now, there's a lot of other things that are important in manifesting your healing. But this is so foundational. And I'd say one out of a hundred or less actually have this attitude. The vast majority of people are just totally going by their feelings and how they feel and they will say and they'll do things and they'll come up in a prayer line and they'll let you pray for them hoping that they'll get healed. But not pray to agree that, hey, I'm already healed and I just want you to agree with me and we're going to turn on these symptoms and stuff like that. There's not very many people that have that attitude and that's why not everybody manifests a healing. Once you understand this and once you believe it, there's a lot of things that you can do. In uh, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. So if you truly believe that you've been healed and that you've got raising from the dead power on the inside of you, it's not enough to just believe that and acknowledge it, but then you need to act in agreement with that. And so stand up man, and the faith of God, the power of God is voice activated. So what you do is stand up and say, man, thank you, Father, that I'm already healed by your stripes. I was healed, 1 Peter, Peter 2, 24. And the scripture says that death and life are in the power of my tongue. So cancer in the name of Jesus, I curse you. Amen. I'm already healed. I got this raising from the dead power on the inside of me. And so I use this power and I curse you, cancer. I command every cancer cell in my body to die and get mad. Oh, I thought we aren't supposed to be mad. You aren't supposed to be mad with people, but it's fine to be mad with the devil. I was in a church one time preaching along these lines and the pastor stopped me and said, we don't even get mad at the devil around here. And I said, no wonder you got problems. You should be mad at the devil. It's okay. God gave you the capacity for anger, not to get mad at people, but to get mad at sickness, to get mad at why am I, boy, I'm stirring myself up. <laughs> I hate sickness. I hate sickness. And not just sickness. I hate weakness. I hate inadequacy. I hate all of this kind of stuff. This is not how God made us to be. And I'm telling you, the vast majority of people in my ministry that I see heal, it's because they get this attitude that I'm talking about and they just get angry and stirred up. And instead of asking God to do something, they start believing God has done it. He's given this to me and they turn on those things. And that's when they see the devil flee. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. And I can guarantee there's people right here in this auditorium right now 
that you are praying for healing, you desire it, you long for it, you cry, you beg, you scream, but you don't believe that you're already healed. You don't believe that you have power to do anything, so you are passive. You're like in the back seat. Would you please take me to this place? And you're always begging to go someplace. You need to get in the driver's seat. You need to start taking charge and saying, hey, if God's already healed me, I'm not staying this way anymore. Carly, come up here just a second, would you? Some of you have uh, heard Carly's testimony. This is uh, Mike 2. I want you to share just a little bit, but I heard at the last healing seminar, how many of you have heard Hannah's testimony about little Hannah that was healed? Well, not everybody, but anyway, their daughter, Hannah, was 11 years ago, was raised off her deathbed. And it's a miracle. But even before that, here's what I wanted you to share, Carly. She, Carly was in a wheelchair. Yep. And she talked about this, and it just amazed me last time you told this. And, and what did you do? Just give the Cliff Notes edition of this. I didn't know anything about fatal healing. I'd had so many seizures. I had some brain damage, and then basically I had not much feeling from the waist down. So I was 18 years old. I was born again about a year. I knew nothing about faith, nothing about healing, nothing about the power of my words. But I was just stubborn. And I got a picture on the inside of me that I knew that that wasn't what God had for me. That wasn't God's best for me. And uh, at 18 years old, I wanted to climb a mountain with my youth group in three, year, in three months' time in the summer. And I just determined, you know what, God has more for me than, than being sick. That being in a wheelchair is not God's plan for me. That he has good things for me, amen, and it doesn't include being sick. Amen. And so I'm just like, Jesus, you're going to have to show me how to do this because I don't, I don't know how to get from where I am now to walking in health. I don't have any point of reference for that at all. I don't even know anyone that's ever been healed. And so he, you know, he just said to me, believe me for what you can right now and a little bit more every day, just a little bit more. I'm like, I can do that. And so I just set my faith out. I kept that picture of where I wanted to be in front of me, of where I wanted to be, of what walking looked like. I, rem- I visualized myself walking. I visualized myself getting out of that wheelchair. I visualized myself climbing that mountain. And I said, that, that's the person I am. That's where I'm going. I knew where I wanted to be. And so I just, God showed me how to do it. I just stood up one day and I, and I realized that believing where I was right now meant I had to do things in stages. I think sometimes people were just sick for such a long time, they don't know how to get from where they're at right now. Once you get sick in there. your mind, they have sick thinking. that's harder than being healed of sick in your body. Mm-hmm. Body is easy, but the way you think, if you're sick in the way you think, that takes time. Absolutely. And I, I had to change, I had to change um, my picture on the inside before I could see it on and the And you were talking about how you were in this wheelchair and you just, what, pulled yourself up? You, yeah, I realized it. The first, if you want to climb a mountain, you're not just going to run out of a wheelchair and go climb a mountain. Okay, now you may have the faith for that, but I didn't. And so I, I, I realized that I just needed to stop by taking one step. And that, if I was going to take one step, I had to learn how to stand again. So I said, okay, legs, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to stand. And so I spoke, I spoke to my legs. I said, this, this legs, you're going to bear weight. And I pulled myself up using the, the bathroom sink there until I could let go and not fall over. And, and once I realized I could stand, I realized I could take one step. I mean, to me, I just had to break it down in my mind, literally step by step. And I said, okay, okay, legs, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take one step. And I took one step. And when I realized I could take one step, I'm like, hang a second. If I can take one step, I can take two steps. Genius factor right there, right? <laughs> this is the disciple moment, okay? Uh, so if you're even just a little bit smarter than I am, you can do this. This is easy. And so once I've taken two steps, um, I just realized I'm, I'm going to keep walking. I look back at my wheelchair and I've taken 10 steps. And so I was at the front door and I was like, well, I'm not going to walk all the way back and get back in my wheelchair now, right? That's stupid. I'm just opened the front door and I kept on walking and three months later I climbed a mountain. That was it. And so if I remember this correctly, you walked from your house down to where some of your friends were playing tennis. Yeah, a couple of miles down the road at the community tennis school, they were playing tennis. So she went from being in a wheelchair to walking a couple of miles and it took you how long to even stand up? I know, I think standing up was the hardest bit, probably, probably a couple of days once I really set my mind to it. I mean, but once I realized I can, I can stand, I, took one, I, fr- I went from standing to taking to, yeah, playing tennis. Isn't so, that awesome? It's just like I just had to get it in my brain first. And did you know what? It's not like God all of a sudden healed her. She was already healed. Right. But she just decided, it's mine. I'm going to take Amen. this. I'm not going to accept this. 
That's and what I want to do this year. Don't quit. Get started and don't quit. Isn't she awesome? Praise the Lord. And there are some of you that you need to do the same thing. You may not be in a wheelchair, but you just need to do the same thing. If you were healed, then why are you so passive? Why are you waiting on God? Why are you coming here desperate? I have people come up to me by the thousands and they want to tell me how bad their situation is to impress on me the hopelessness, trying to get me to feel pity so that somehow or another that'll move me. And it does just the opposite. What it says to me is that you don't have a clue, that you don't know what the Word of God says. You know what? I don't have people come up to me and say, hey, I know I'm healed. I believe I'm healed. I am healed, healed, healed. I know it. But man, I'm still struggling with some symptoms. Would you agree with me? I don't have people approach me like that because the people with that attitude are healed. But I have people by the thousands come and tell me how bad it is and just hoping that somehow or another I will give them something that they don't have. I don't have a gift of healing. I've seen people raised from the dead, two people in my own family. I've seen lots of people raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen awesome miracles, but I don't have a gift of healing. I just know what the Word says, and I know how to pray, and I know how to take my authority. If you've come here for me to get you healed, and you're looking at me, you're going to be disappointed because that's not my ministry. There are other people, you know, Daniel Kalinda that uh, Daniel talked about. He's one of those guys that has a gift of healing. Matter of fact, I was talking to him just a year ago or so, and Daniel was talking to me, and they see crusades with, uh, I don't know, I, I don't think I'm misrepresented to say that they have a million people at some of their crusades, and they'll have 100,000 people born again, and they will see, uh, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of people miraculously healed because he's got a gift of miracles, and God uses that. But Daniel was asking me, how do you just believe for a healing? <laughs> he doesn't know. And I was sitting here teaching him how to just stand and believe. They're two different delivery systems. You know, if the only way that you could get healed is to understand what I'm talking about, to grow in the Word, to get mature, and to renew your mind and get to where you aren't carnal, but instead you're believing what the Word says over what you feel, that takes time to renew your mind. And if that was the only way that you could be healed, then if you came forward today and got born again, but you had a terminal illness and you were only a week away from dying, you'd just be destined to die because you hadn't got time to renew your mind and grow and understand these things. So because of that, God has people in the body of Christ that do have a supernatural gift of healing and you can come and get healed off of their faith. Not with it, it's, you can't do it in 100% unbelief, but it takes minimal amount of faith. What I call a passive faith instead of an active faith. You can get healed off of another person's faith if uh, they're strong and you aren't. And so God can do that, but it was never, never, never intended that this should be the way that the body of Christ received. This is a stopgap measure. For you, you know, if you've got, if you're already in a crisis, if you've only got a week to live or something, it's a, it's a temporary way of God dealing with things until you get your mind renewed and start exercising the power of God that's on the inside of you. And because God loves you so much, He will heal people like that. But that was never intended to be God's method. The way that all of us should receive healing is for you to renew your mind and recognize you've got the same power living on the inside of you that raised Christ from the dead that if you would get this attitude and resist the devil, he would flee from you. And when you get that determination that Carly was talking about and you just start saying, I'm going to stand. If it takes two days, you just you just do what it takes until you do it. And if you stand, well, then take one step and then take the next step. And you just get in there. I'm healed and I refuse to be this way. And you know what? You'll manifest healing because it's the supernatural power of God in you. It's not God who pulls the trigger and releases the power of God. God has already placed this power on the inside of you, and it's you that pulls the trigger. It's you that releases the power of God. In the third chapter of the book of Acts, they were going into the temple, and Peter and John looked at the man who was lame, and they said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I 
unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they grabbed the man by the hand and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he went walking and leaping and praising God. And they said, such as I have, such as I have. Did you know that gets you kicked out of nearly any church in the world today to say that you have it? Who do you think you are? Well, I'm nothing, but, you know, it says without, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Carrie used that verse this morning, and I agree with that 100%. But I'm never without him. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. If you can just talk about my physical self, about Andrew Womack, I'm nothing. But Christ is on the inside of me, and he never leaves me, and therefore I have the resurrection power of God. There are some of you that because you've heard me and you've heard me give testimony about my son being raised from the dead after being dead for five hours in a morgue on a cooler and come back to life with no brain damage. You hear things like this and you think, man, you got power. If I could just come to you. But the truth is you got the exact same power. There is no difference between me and you except the renewing of my mind. That is the only difference. And I'm certainly not where I need to be, but I renewed my more, mind more than it used to be and more than some people. And so therefore I see some things happen. But the truth is every one of you, every one of you have raising from the dead power on the inside of you. And if it's not manifesting, whether it's healing or whether it's finances or emotions or whatever it is, it's not God who hasn't released that power. It's you that hasn't believed it. And the number one thing that holds people back is just being carnal. Well, I don't feel encouraged. Who cares? I don't feel faith. I don't feel bold. Man, I'm not against feelings. I'm not against them. But you know what? I enjoy them if they are what I want them to be. But if they are what I don't want them to be, I ignore them. I'll reject them. I'll actually fight against my feelings. There's lots of times that, man, I've just felt like crying, giving up and quitting. And I'll start praising God and dancing, glorifying God and doing things just to resist my feelings and emotions. And somebody says, well, that's hypocritical. It just depends on who you think is you. Do I think that this emotional person is, is the real me? No, it's just my vehicle I get around in. I'm a new person in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I've got love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That's who I am in the spirit. And so if I act discouraged, if I act depressed, if I act sick, some people think, well, I'm just trying to be real. You're just being real carnal. That's what you are. You're living out of your physical, natural self. But in the spirit, man, you've got love, joy, and peace. You've got faith. You have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And you are not a hypocrite to say that you're healed when the doctor can't verify it. Now, you could be a hypocrite if you really see yourself as a carnal person, but you just heard me preach this, and so you're going to mimic me and say it because I said it, but you don't really believe it. Well, that's hypocritical. But if you could believe what I'm saying and understand who you are in the Spirit and get to where you believe it from your heart, this is who I am. I'm a healed person. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what anybody says. I'm healed. You get like that, and you believe it, and you do that over a consistent period of time, and it's impossible for your body to go any other way except to be healed. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. To be carnally minded is death. And again, carnal doesn't necessarily be sinful minded. You don't have to be out in sin or hating God. Just be natural. Just be going by when people say, how are you? Oh man, I hurt all over. You carnal thing. You're going to die. How are you today? Oh, the doctor says I got stage four cancer. Who cares what the doctor says? I don't give a flip what the doctor says. I couldn't care less what a doctor has to say. 
You know, my board made me go for a physical back, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago or something like this because they wanted me to take out an insurance policy. I didn't have any insurance. And so, I, you know, the only reason I ever got insurance was because of Obama. It cost less to get insurance than it did to pay the fine. And until Obama came out with that, I never had insurance. And, and if they repeal Obamacare, I won't have insurance again which I know a lot of you think that's all wrong and that's, it would be wrong for you, but I'm never sick. I just wasted my money. So anyway, they wanted me to go get an insurance policy, a key man policy if something happened so that the ministry would be covered. So anyway, it's a long story, but I went, I witnessed to the doctor. I told him about my son being raised from the dead and they were just gobsmacked over the whole thing. They were looking at me and I witnessed them, and anyway, I went into this treadmill test. They said you could quit any time. So I could have quit at eight minutes, nine minutes, 10 minutes. I went the full 15 minutes, but at 12 minutes and something, after I got through, they got to looking at this printout, and this doctor got to looking and grunting the way they do and looking at things. And he says, oh, man, there's a ser- you got a serious problem here. And he wrote out this name and he said, here's a name and address of a doctor and a colleague of mine. You go over, you get more tests. We're going to put you in the hospital and we may do open heart surgery on you before the evening is over. And you know what? They, what I believe the problem was, they wanted to shave the hair on my chest. (laughs) And I told them, I said, this is virgin hair. It's never been touched. I said, you can't shave the hair on my chest. And so because of it, I talked them into just sticking them on there. And when I got to running and sweating, those things started falling off. So I was holding two of them. The doctor was holding two and the nurse was holding two. And I was jogging with these things. And I believe that that's the reason it probably messed up. But anyway, he he just says, you got this serious problem. You got to go get another test. And it just stunned me. And for a minute or two, I, I, I mean, just a second or two, I looked at him. And finally, I said, that's a lie. I said, there's nothing wrong with my heart. And this guy just, he just looked at me. I guess he wasn't used to people saying he lied. (laughs) He says, what are you saying? And I said, that, I do not have a heart problem. I said, you look at that and tell me that that says I got a heart problem. He began to apologize. He says, well, everybody's heart's a little bit different. And you could be totally normal, but I just think we ought to get more tests. And I said, you lied to me. You told me I had a serious heart problem. I said, you lied. I went to rebuking this doctor. (laughs) And this doctor just tore that piece of paper up and said, leave, amen. And he kicked me out of his office and he flunked me on the test and they wouldn't give me the insurance. And so this doctor who's on my board in Louisiana had me go down there and they put this nuclear dye in you and they did a stress test. And he said, I got the heart of a 17 year old. There was no problems. But, and he also told me, he says, never, never trust one of those treadmill tests. Those things are 50% wrong all of the time. He says, never go by one of those things. And yet I bet you there's many of you in here that have probably taken a course of action based on some treadmill test and the chances are it was wrong. The point I'm making, I'm not against doctors again, but I'm just saying they're people. And when God's word tells me that I'm well, I don't care what any man tells me. It does not carry a lick of weight with me. The only thing it might do is make me think, well, you know, I need to believe God in this area, but I guarantee you, I am not going to let a doctor's word be the final word in my life. And I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. (laughs) I think you're weird for letting somebody talk you out of what Jesus has done. By his stripes, you were healed. You were healed. And so now activate it with your words. Curse cancer, curse sickness, curse pain, curse the botch, the itch, a rash, whatever it is that you got. Curse toenail fungus. Curse it. Talk to it. Scripture says, Mark eleven twenty three. 23, whosoever shall say to this mountain. Don't, it didn't say talk to God about your mountain. It says talk to your mountain. 
Say, itch in the name of Jesus. I curse you. I command you to get off my body, out of my body. And then it says death and life and start speaking life. I'm healed. I'm healed. Body, you're healed. Cancer, whatever you've done to this body, I just release the life of God and body, you're recovering. Appetite, you're coming back. And you start speaking and then you start acting. Faith without works is dead. And there's other things you can do, but I'm telling you, if you would fight not because you're trying to get healed, but because you are healed and Satan is trying to steal from you what is rightfully yours and you aren't going to just take it laying down. And if you fought because you were healed instead of fighting to get healed, you would see a greater manifestation. You know, Carly didn't understand what she was doing, but she was, she was taking these principles that we're talking about and doing it. She just knew that God had something better. She knew that that wasn't the way she was supposed to be. And she quit being passive. And I haven't heard Carly say this, but I bet you she would verify that she prayed and asked God for healing and she wanted out of the wheelchair and all of those things. But there just came a time that finally, I'm going to do this. And she took a step of faith. And I'm encouraging you today that God's done his part. There's not a person in here that's waiting on God to heal them and just looking for the magic combination that you've got to do certain things and then eventually God will heal you. God's already done his part. He's seated at the Father's right hand. He is not healing people today. You were healed. That healing power is already inside of you and you activate it. You've got to release it. Quit asking God to do what he told you to do. He told you to resist the devil and he'd flee from you. He told you to go heal the sick. He didn't tell you to pray that he would heal the sick. He says, you heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils. Matthew chapter 10, verse eight. You do it. You get up and resist the devil. I don't know how you're still sitting there. I know that there's some of you that need healing. You ought to be doing something. You ought to be resisting the devil. Amen. You ought to be speaking to your problem. This is good news. And you know, this is why, this is why we have the absolute confidence that when we pray with people, that it's God's will to heal every person, every time, because he's already done it. How can you doubt that he will do what he's already done? God has already healed you. We say with... 